welcome, good evening. As some of you have heard me say many times over the last couple of years, we have a tradition of not introducing our own, and I'm not going to introduce my friend and colleague, Sarah Davis, in the way she deserves. Uh, but these have been an extraordinary couple of years, and so we've departed from our tradition a bit. And uh, since this is the last Friday lecture of the year, I just wanted to say a couple of things before I, I turn it over to Ms. Davis. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, there's a lot of competing things going on. It's great to see uh, so many of you out tonight. Um, we do have one more lecture next Wednesday, and I hope you're aware of that, Samantha Rose Hill lecturing on Hannah Arendt, uh, loneliness uh, and totalitarianism. Um, I want to thank the folks who've supported the lecture series this year, Thomas McBee and his team, the Dean's Office, B&G. <laughs> These, these have been extraordinary times, and there's been a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of things have, have been decided and changed at the last minute and so on, and I'm, I'm grateful for the goodwill of so many folks on the staff and faculty and, uh, and the flexibility that many of you have shown um, to continue to try to make this series such an important part of our program and our community. And as I said, I'm not going to introduce my, my colleague, but I want to thank Sarah Davis for uh, well in advance when we didn't know, you know how things were going to go this spring. Um, uh, deciding to offer a lecture and being willing to offer the last Friday lecture of the year and one that would connect to what the seniors uh, were reading, uh, Heidegger and the question concerning technology. Uh, and I think with that, uh, we will turn it over to Ms. Davis, whose lecture is titled, The Hidden Side of Their Nearness. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Davis. Welcome, thank you for coming um, to this very last Friday night lecture of the year. <laughs> um, I'm excited to be here and to share this thinking with you. So as Mr. Sterling said, the lecture is entitled The Hidden Side of Their Nearness. In 2007, as a graduate student in cultural anthropology, I went to the French island of Corsica to do fieldwork for my dissertation. My husband David and son Jackson came with me. I spent much of my time on the island with a group of self-described cultural militants. Corsica, not unlike the Basque Country and Catalonia in Spain, has seen the rise of a nationalist movement over the past 50 years dedicated to the island's political autonomy. While most of the cultural militants I got to know were active in the Nationalist Party, their explicit aims were not political, but cultural, to revive traditional Corsican culture. They were passionately dedicated to the patrimoine that they felt was being lost. The Corsican language, the traditional Corsican singing, the pagela, which is what was playing when you walked in, traditional Corsican food, architecture, and more generally speaking, a traditional way of life, a manière d'être. I dove into that world, the discussions and practices designed to help revive what people felt was being lost. I interviewed shepherds, traditional singers, Corsican language activists, instrument makers, founders of village associations, ethnographic museum curators, as well as fervent nationalists and others. David and Jackson came along for much of it. We ate plates of figatelu, the blood sausage, roasted over the fire with sides of the brooch, goat cheese, and polenta made from chestnut flour. We hiked miles into the mountains for afternoons of traditional feasting and singing. We traveled across the island in our tiny car to go to Les Foires, festivals, where traditional products produced in traditional ways were sold. It wasn't until much later, after I started teaching at St. John's and began to study Heidegger, that I realized that the argument I made in my own work, what I saw the Corsican militants to be struggling with, has great precedent. Heidegger's thinking radically opens up the question I was tracking down. Tonight, I will consider Heidegger's essay, The Question Concerning Technology, and the way his thinking about technology overlaps with the Corsican concern about their loss of the patrimoine in the winds of modernity and change. My field notes, in which I reflect on the experiences I had during my 18 months of fieldwork on the island, are not an attempt to extract the Corsican situation 
and put it on a shelf next to the accounts of the Basque and Catalonian cases. Rather, the notes engage in a mode of description and questioning that attempts to bring something forward, something that may have been pronounced given Corsican circumstances at the time, but something that may be true about the human condition more generally. And so the goal is twofold, to unpack Heidegger in order to understand the Corsicans, but also to delve into the world of the Corsicans to recall ever again anew the insights of Heidegger. Part one, 140 goats. It was late afternoon in December. We drove off the ferry onto the Mediterranean island of Corsica in the tiny Renault Twingo we had just bought from a used car salesman on the outskirts of Nice. 15-month-old Jackson peeked out from between the suitcases to see what was coming. Our drive into the mountains from the coast was sunny and cold. The odor of the maquis, the sweet-smelling island shrubbery, slipped through the cracks of the car. We had vast views of steely peaks speckled with bright green patches and the occasional cow or herd of goats. Ancient walls came in and out of view on the lower portions of the mountains, marking defunct terrace farms, old estate boundaries, shepherd's paths, and on occasion, the remnants of a Roman road. Our life on Corsica was centered around Sri Lanka, the small village where we lived. What at first glance seemed like a string of 40 or so cramped houses crumbling into each other and the mountainside on which they were perched revealed itself over time to be a whole universe of passages and networks that allow people to move from one part of the village to another without ever touching the main road. And it is a universe that people of the village know intimately, the way one knows a childhood home. It was in Sri Lanka, listening to the Pagiela singers in the back corner of the musty church on rainy afternoons, or spending hours sitting on the wall surrounding La Place at the base of the village, listening to village talk, greeting the locals as they began to make eye contact with me and take notice of Jackson, it was here that we found our place in Corsican life. One of my, I'm gonna get water quick. One of my activities in the first few months of our stay on the island was to accompany Stephanie, a young woman who worked for Casio Casano, a Corsican association aimed to support shepherds of the tradition on her visits to shepherds across the island. There were a total of 700 shepherds on Corsica and 300 of them called fermiers produced their own milk and cheese using traditional methods. Casio Casano promoted the fermier, describing their product in this way, quote, the perfumed plants of the Maquis and the great manual skill and experience of each shepherd confer on their cheese a bouquet of, and personality directly linked to the territory. That's from their brochure in 2008. Stephanie's official role was to help the traditional shepherds standardize their product to attain a statute of sanitation that would allow them to sell their product in stores and export it. Stephanie told me that she worried about the ability of traditional cheese production to survive in today's marketplace. Casio Casano, with funding from the local government, organized professional training sessions, les stages, to teach shepherds about effectively raising their herd, élevage, how to best nourish their goats or sheep on the local maquis, etc., and about the production of cheese, the importance of maintaining a constant temperature as the cheese sets, sanitizing the environment, etc. These stages, however, were markedly unsuccessful. In one interview, when I asked Marcel, a middle-aged, long-time traditional shepherd, about his training for Berger, about th this training for Berger, he lifted his eyes, gave an ironic smile, and lowered them again. Quote, you do not decide to be a Berger one day and become one the next. It takes experience, it takes life. You have to watch, you have to know your animals, end quote. I asked him to give me an example. Quote, you have to know if they're pregnant, how they carry their young, what they look like when they're sick. There's so many things. You can't know without li living them. It's different for each animal. And it's the same with the cheese making class, he went on. You learn technical terms, but you don't learn anything about what it takes to make cheese. I went back to interview Damien, one of the younger shepherds I had met with Stephanie. Damien had built his bergerie years before with his father, a lifetime shepherd himself. As we were talking, a goat, who was the first of the herd to come trampling down from the surrounding mountains, ran into the shack where we were talking, bleated and bleated, teasing us, and then ran out before Damien could catch him. Damien laughed and quickly closed the door. 
They try to get inside to get the bread, he said, bolting the door and opening the window. He took pieces of stale bread from a bag and threw them out for the goats. They nudged each other and came nosing forward. He called each affectionately by name, telling me about their various personalities. There were about 140 of them. We walked outside and I asked him if he had a favorite. Bah oui, this one. He leaned down to a female goat named Amandine, who nuzzled his cheek. Damien made his cheese in a small cave-like structure beside the shack where we had been talking. For us, he said, the standards are aimed to make our cheese like industrial cheese, but our cheese is not industrial cheese, and we don't want it to be. It bears no resemblance to, it has rien à voir avec industrial cheese, he said. For Damien, good cheese reflects, or should reflect, for example, the temperature of the day it was made that there is not a constant temperature for the cheese to set in in most traditional caves is totally impractical from an industrial point of view. If the temperature varies too much in any given day, all the cheese will go bad and will have to be thrown out. When the possibility of jeter le fromage, throwing out the cheese, came up with Christophe, another older shepherd I interviewed, he said, yes, I've had to throw out batches of cheese sometimes. It's true of all real shepherds. You find it sometimes thrown out in the maquis, but that's the way it is. Some days it's too hot, some days it's too cold. Stephanie's biggest concern for the shepherds was that their methods were not réglé, well-ordered, well cadré, structured, standardisé, standardized. Her efforts aimed to take chance out of the equation and help the shepherds produce a more consistent product and have more lucrative business. This was, she said, what was required for the tradition to be saved. But for Damien and the other shepherds, chance is central to what their product is. In fact, it is in the inconsistency that traditional cheese bears witness to the conditions in which it comes to be what it is. Damien told me that by eating and appreciating cheese made from the variety of animals, seasons, temperatures, etc., one is closer to, as he put it, the, quote, reality of the patrimoine, closer to Corsica herself. End quote. Part two, bringing forth. Heidegger opens his essay, The Question Concerning Technology, by asking, what is technology? He starts by defining it as he expects we will, instrumentally. Technology, we typically think, is the human activity of positing ends and then figuring out how to achieve them. We make instruments to realize our goals. But he pauses here, urging us to slow down, to look more closely at this instrumental definition, suggesting that it doesn't uncover technology in its essence. He wonders about the context in which it makes sense to ask about means and ends, the context in which instrumentality is even thinkable. For instrumentality to make sense, he says, causality must already be in place. To consider a means to an end, one must take for granted that one thing can cause another. That seems reasonable. But what is this causality that is already in place, he probes. He turns to Aristotle's notion of the four causes, the material cause, the formal cause, the proximate cause, and the final cause. Heidegger posits a silver chalice as a thought experiment and identifies its four causes. The material cause is the silver out of which it is made. The formal cause, the form or shape into which the silver is poured. The efficient cause, the silversmith, and its final cause, the sacrificial rite, which was the impulse for make it in the first place. That's straightforward enough. We've outlined the conditions that make the silver chalice possible. But does this get at what causality is in its essence? The classical notion of causality seems subject to misunderstanding on our part, tempting us to think we've captured the cause of something if we can check off the boxes of the four causes. What is the cause of Corsican cheese? The goat's milk as the material cause, the instruments of milking, and of the shepherd's cave as the formal causes. The shepherd as the proximate cause, nourishment as the final cause. But does such a list illuminate what is actually important about something coming into being? In such a list, we get a description of the conditions that are present as something arises. But does that give us a satisfying account of what is entailed in causing what is actually quite remarkable? something that simply was not present to become present. Heidegger, Heidegger shifts the terms away from Aristotle momentarily and introduces the notion of a cause as a, quote, 
bringing about such that something falls out in a certain way, end quote. He calls our attention to the Greek word for cause, aition, which is literally to be responsible for. And he suggests the cause is that to which something else is indebted. The chalice owes thanks to, in his words, is indebted to the silver, the chalice form, the silversmith's activity, etc. And likewise, as the Corsican fermier point out, their cheese is indebted not only to a checklist of the sort that Stephanie is intent on standardizing and enhancing, but to an indefinite set of circumstances that usher forth each particular piece of cheese. In Damien's words, ultimately, his product reflects and owes thanks not to an ordered list of conditions that one in theory could control and reproduce at will, but something much harder to simply articulate, to articulate the patrimon, Corsica herself. What is added when we talk about causality in terms of owing and indebtedness on the part of the effect and a kind of responsibility for on the side of the cause? At this point, I find it useful to turn momentarily to Rousseau for an image that arises for me when I read his discourse on the origin of inequality. In this discourse, Rousseau posits natural man, a man who exists before society. One of the unique characteristics natural man possesses is something like perfectibility. Natural man, according to Rousseau, is unlike the bird that he imagines in his text, a bird who will die of starvation if it does not have access to its normal food, even if it is sitting upon a viable kind of nourishment, because the bird lacks flexibility, adaptability. Natural man, however, is flexible. I imagine Rousseau's natural man walking through the woods, suddenly faced with a threatening beast. He is in danger. Unlike other animals who use only what they are born with to defend themselves, I imagine natural man reaching out into his environment, finding a stick that fits his palm, lengthens his reach, and increases the force of his blow. At the moment he grabs the stick, he conceives of the bounds within which the stick begins to be what it is, a club of a sort. In that moment, natural man stands at something like the crossroads of Aristotle's four causes, the material, the formal, the proximate, and the final, all at stake, not with a fulfilled checklist in hand, but reaching out into an environment of possibility, one which has not yet been defined, which can arrive now one way and now another, and setting something originally on its way. After scaring off the beast, I imagine that natural man swings the club onto his back and figures out a way to secure it there. The next time he encounters a threat, he reaches not into the undetermined wilds of his environment, where in a sense anything is possible, but to his back, where he knows where his weapon will be, where the possibilities have been determined. In such a moment, he is arguably at one remove from that original, we might say causal, stance in which he reached out and ushered forth a previously unrealized possibility in which he brought something that simply had not been into being. For Heidegger, a cause is a bringing something into appearance that previously had been absent, not there. A cause is a letting something come forth into presencing, a setting it free, setting something on its way to arrival. He calls this movement occasioning, which is, he argues, the essence of causality as the Greeks thought of it, providing an occasion for something to start on its way. Just as Heidegger asks about the conditions that make instrumentality poss possible, causality, he now asks, what is the context in which occasioning, setting something on its way, is conceivable? He answers that setting something on its way is only possible if bringing can happen. After all, setting something on its way requires that it be brought from one state to another. This bringing, he says, is a bringing forth, occasioning of natural man's weapon, of Corsican cheese, of anything at all, is predicated on the possibility of such bringing forth. In nature, Heidegger suggests this sort of coming to presence arises within a living being itself, a bursting open in itself, an arrival of something that was not present into presence. I imagine a plant growing up out of itself toward the sun, or Jackson growing up out of himself or into himself, four inches in six months. When it is the bursting open in another, it happens through techne, the arts and crafts. All this Heidegger calls poiesis. He emphasizes poiesis must be understood 
not as modern day poetry, but in the full sense that the Greeks meant it, a making, fabrication, creation, At this moment in his essay, Heidegger returns to the beginning of his inquiry to ask anew, what does all this have to do with technology? He introduces two more terms, which he argues must be in place for poiesis to be thinkable. Every bringing forth necessarily takes place in the realm of revealing, a context in which it is possible to move from the concealed to the unconcealed. In order for something to show up, for Jackson's new height, for the shepherd's piece of cheese, to become realities, they must come from a state of not showing. Unconcealment is the movement of revealing, and this is the realm where truth, aletheia, happens. It's worth noting here that the different terms that Heidegger introduces are not adding anything new to our understanding, but rather foregrounding what must already be in place, what we must already be taking for granted, given our assumptions about instrumentality and causality. If we don't allow for a context in which what is not present becomes present, in which what has not been disclosed becomes disclosed, in other words, where truth can arrive, there could be no instrumentality, no innovation, no technology as we typically understand it. As we've said, techne, unlike fusis, nature, is, Heidegger says, a revealing of, quote, whatever does not bring itself forth, as he puts it, Quote, whatever does not yet lie here before us, whatever can turn out now one way, now another, end quote. The stick can turn out to be a club or a staff or a spear or an arrow. Damien's cheese turns out now one way, now another. We should re reconsider my Rousseau digression here momentarily. We might be tempted to think that the source of this coming to presence is something like human need, necessity breeding invention. We're faced with a threat, which forces us to look outside of ourselves for help, and that need determines what we pull out of the haze of possibilities. But arguably, Heidegger's thought experiment with a silver chalice shows the essence of the technological more clearly because the chalice does not answer an immediate need in the same way. As a ritualistic vessel, the chalice establishes a kind of relationship of reverence to the haze of possibilities out of which it arises. There are hidden gifts in that vast haze of unwritten possibilities. We wait, listen, and are thankful for their arrival. A reverence is molded onto the chalice itself, reflected in its very nature as a sacred object. Heidegger's use of the chalice as his first example of the technological is surprising, and it suggests that the very character of poiesis, of bringing forth, is not primarily induced by what we think of as practical need, or at least that such need is not enough to account for it. Clearly, other animals experience the pressures of natural man, but not all make weapons. It may be that natural man's reaching out is a response to a pressure on his well-being, but the fact that this is even a possibility for him, that it occurs to him to reach out, to usher forth, to create, requires that he have a relationship to the vast haze of possibilities as just that, a realm where something can be brought forth, can reveal itself. And as such, man has an original relationship to the realm of showing, of aletheia, of truth. This relationship, which must already be in place to set anything on its way, for bringing forth of instruments to be conceivable at all, seems closer to what Heidegger considers the essence of the technological to be. When it occurs to hypothetical natural man, to turn to his environment, to set a club on its way, freeing it to be what it is, he stands in a unique relationship to the four causes and something original happens. It is an occasion. And I think we can imagine a reverence arising as the chalice or the club or the cheese sing of hitherto concealed possibilities. It is not inconceivable that natural man would name his weapon, putting a mark on it that shows not only that it is his, but in a sense reflects its value, its unique birth into the world, like Damien's naming of Amandine. Part three, challenging forth. The shepherd's worries about Stephanie's efforts to standardize cheese production relate to where Heidegger's essay goes next. After meditating on the character of the poetic bringing forth, 
that necessarily plays a part in technological production. Heidegger's essay takes a turn. He suggests that in modern technology, poiesis has retreated and a new mode of revealing, what he characterizes as challenging forth rather than bringing forth, has come to bear. In his thinking about the difference between bringing forth and challenging forth, Heidegger compares a windmill to the hauling of coal and ore. The windmill is an example of bringing forth. It stands in the wind, in a sense, unobtrusive. As the sails turn, it acts as an energy source, but sometimes the sails ease to a halt and one waits, attentive, wondering when the wind will arrive again. Sometimes the wind blows and sometimes it doesn't. It isn't simply up to us. The windmill does not hide that the work it does is not reducible to a set of circumstances reproducible at will, a kind of calculative mapping, but is in fact an occasion, a happening. Faced with the technological expressed in this way, man is in a position to understand himself as a custodian of the winds coming to presence in the form of his production of flower or timber. These products fulfill his needs, but they also bear witness to revealing itself. In the hauling of coal and ore, however, Heidegger worries that such insight is likely lost. The miners, rather than tending to the earth as custodians of its coming to presence, set upon it in the sense of challenging it. What the earth is becomes understood to be a mineral deposit. Our relationship to it becomes one of systematic extraction unlocking nature's storehouse to pull out her treasures in order to place them in our own storehouses, ready for use as we see fit. Heidegger characterizes what is challenged forth rather than brought forth as standing reserve, which is not just stock. Standing reserve is, quote, ordered to stand by, to be immediately at hand, indeed to stand there just so it may be on call for further ordering. In another example, Heidegger thinks about a hydroelectric plant on the Rhine River. He asks us to consider the difference between the Rhine as dammed up and a source of power, and the Rhine as uttered in Holderlin's hymn, quote, it was the voice of the noblest of all rivers, the freeborn Rhine. Heidegger asks, quote, is the Rhine still a river landscape in a world where challenging forth is the mode of revealing, end quote? And he's reluctant to say it is. It is a landscape, quote, in no other way than as an object on call for inspection by a tour group ordered there by the vacation industry, end quote. We can't, he suggests, even really see the Rhine as what it is, because when challenging forth is the mode of revealing, the meaning of all things is determined by what they are on call for, how they fit into a prescribed order or system. We may think we are observing a scene of natural beauty when we go to visit, but in some way, even in that context, we are mining the river for its beauty, for its rest and relaxation, for escape. For Heidegger, modern physics reveals the extent to which this mining attitude towards nature holds us captive. He argues that in the age of modern technology, nature is the chief storehouse of standing reserve, the primary thing to be challenged forth, and that as a science, physics, quote, sets nature up to exhibit itself as a coherence of forces calculable in advance, end quote. Experiments are performed so that nature, when put in different positions, can show itself, report itself. It reports itself in a way that is, quote, identifiable through calculation, and that remains orderable as a system of information, end quote. It seems that in the biological sciences, though we might have systematic explanations for how organisms function, almost as though they are machines, we are less likely, perhaps, to suggest that a mechanistic account or set of laws can simply solve the mystery of what life is. And equally, we are less likely to conflate a textbook explanation of what a living being is with the reality of that being as a thing with a unique arrival into the world. In physics, however, the idea that a falling stone is an example of the law of gravity, or the arc of a soccer ball an example of projectile motion, betrays that we often take the coherence of calculable forces to be primary and the happenings of the world to be instances of those forces. What nature is, in its essence, comes to be understood as the way it reports itself according to the laws we have extracted from it. In the time of modern physics, Heidegger says, quote, it seems as though causality is shrinking into a reporting, 
a reporting challenged forth of standing reserves that must be guaranteed either simultaneously or in sequence, end quote. It becomes nearly impossible to confront natural phenomenon as anything other than evidence of causal chains that have been decided in advance. Importantly, challenging forth as a mode of re revealing for Heidegger is not only how we come to make sense of the world around us, but it also turns inward and becomes the way we organize and understand ourselves. We tend to forget that like natural man, we are in fact in a unique and powerful relationship to the coming to presence of the real, to the realm of aletheia, not as one who systematizes, orders, and reports, but as one who listens and reveals. Part four, the pagiela. Here it is useful to turn to another Corsican example, and really what first drew me to the island. The pagiela is a traditional polyphonic song Unique to Corsica, sung by three voices, the singers stand or sit close, huddled together, facing one another, hands to their ears to hear themselves better. There's a palpable intimacy in these singing rings. The singers don't know in, adv in advance where the song will go. They look intently into each other's eyes and watch each other's mouths for hints of what's coming. They lean in closer to feel the vibrations and movements of the music. The singing typically takes place in festive environments, bars, picnics, dinners, festivals. The strongest singer, called the secunda, launches the song. I was often taken by surprise attending such events when the sounds of a secunda would pierce through the ordinary sounds of human chatter and laughter with a sudden and powerful solemnity. Soon after the secunda launches the verse, the basu, the bass, enters, pulling the soaring secunda down, grounding it, tugging at it. Finally, and most provocatively, the terza enters, the highest voice, pushing the other two intense disharmonies, notes rubbing up against each other rather than meshing. The struggle finally, almost reluctantly, gives way to harmonic resolution, at which point the singers take a sip of their pastis or whiskey, joke, laugh, talk about what happened in the line they've just saw, sung, until the secunda puts his drink down and launches the next verse. Considered even more in the tradition than the singing that occurs in bars and at festivals are a set of spring and summer pilgrimages when cultural militants trek hours into the mountains, often to a chapel or abandoned village, to sing and celebrate the vraie tradition. When I first arrived on Corsica <clears throat> for a summer of preliminary research, I met Jean-Francois, a 30-year-old Corsican who owned a video store on the outskirts of Corte, the small university town down the mountains from Sri Lanka. In our first conversation, when he found out I was an anthropologist, he asked whether I had heard the pagiela. I responded, yes, polyphony. I saw it performed at a church last week. He frowned, shook his head sternly, and then said gravely, not polyphony. That exists partout, everywhere. This is something different. Jean-Francois is himself a cultural militant and a singer of the pagiela. When I returned to the island three years later, David Jackson and I ran into him at one of the pilgrimages in the mountains. It turned out that since the last time I had seen him, he had been doing impressive field work of his own, though he didn't call it that. He had been attending all of the events in the tradition that he could, using a mini video, a mini video recorder. This was before the ubiquity of cell phones. He, reco he recorded all of the traditional singing sessions that he attended family picnics, masses, pilgrimages. He then transcribed the songs in longhand in large black books of which he had amassed 17. He would then go see the singers, usually old men, to, to check his transcriptions. He typed up the lyrics and saved them in a large computerized database attaching the video recordings. He had attended hundreds of, event of events and the database was growing. Later, when he showed me this data collection, he proudly announced, quote, these, these are saved. End quote. After a serendipitous meeting in the mountains, I went to visit Jean-Francois at the video store where he still worked. He was looking online at a list of Corsican singing groups. I said hello and sat down beside him. Do you like them? I asked, pointing to one group, recognizing the name of my Corsican teacher. He looked at where I was pointing. Quote, oh, Sorba, he said and rolled his eyes. I'm telling you, he said, shaking his head. I'll give you an example of what they're like. 
He closed the screen and opened an, a new one. Look, he said, you see Camelo? And pointed, he pointed to a frozen video frame from a video he had taken of the same older man we'd seen singing on the mountaintop the week before. I nodded. He pressed play. It was a smaller gathering than the one where I had heard him singing. Camelo sat at one corner of a long table of family and friends. His face was rough and tan and wildly expressive when he sang. He tilted his head slightly to the side with his hand to his ear to help hear himself. His eyes were open but rolled up a bit as he sang, and he swayed slightly with the song. His voice was rough and wobbly, and you could hear the sound of the breeze against the video recorder. Jean-Francois beamed. There was something so loving about Jean-Francois's regard and something so in uninhibited about Camelo singing. When Camelo finished the song, the tables of his family and friends erupted in laughter and applause. This song, Jean-Francois said, it is the same song, the same that Maya Pesh, Maya Pesh is a famous Corsican singer, that Maya Pesh sings. He reached for a, sa a stack of CDs, found the one he was looking for, and put it on for me, humming as the song as he arranged everything. An example, he said, voila. Maya Pesh's rendition of the song begins with a reverberated and very produced sounding classical guitar part. As Maya Pesh began to sing, Jean-Francois playfully mimicked his operatic voice as the notes soared. Over the music, he turned to me and said, now you can do whatever you want, and we listened a bit more. He stopped the song and continued, or you can do what Camelo does. He pressed play again on the computer, but it's not the same. You can't tell me it's the same. You're gonna ask me what the difference is between this and that, he went on. But what do you want me to say? You have to listen. We spent the next hour watching different videos that Jean-Francois had filmed over the previous few years at different gatherings and compared them to videos he found online of the most famous Corsican groups. Toward the end, Jean-Francois told me, quote, what the singers do today is merde, crap. No, no, listen, each person should sing his possibility, what he wants, but each one, in my opinion, should make an effort for the tradition and the culture. You can, you can make this, he said, indicating the Maya Pesh CD. For example, Camelo, can he go on stage? Him, Camelo, he's capable, you see how he is. But those singers you saw last night, he was referring to a professional concert I had seen the previous night boasting the most beautiful voices in Corsica. They cannot sing as Camelo does. They cannot, not anymore. And this means that, and it's not malicious what I say. This good man here, he said, pointing again toward the Maya Pesh CD, he cannot learn because he didn't learn. The problem is that every year you have more and more who sing ching, 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 and he strummed an imaginary guitar, and less and less who sing like Camelo, less and less. Like Jean-Francois, virtually all of the singers I interviewed insisted that the pagiela is not what you see in concerts performed by the many island groups in which six to eight singers, typically dressed in black, stand in a straight line across the stage facing outward toward the audience, each at a microphone. Their repertoire is memorized and practiced and sometimes accompanied by bass and drums. I was told again and again that the pagiela is not a performance that pitch pipes are a sign of falsity, as are lyric sheets and performative self-conscious energy. Even putting traditional songs on CDs is often looked down upon by many of today's militants. Virtually all of the militant singers I interviewed contrasted singing in the vraie tradition with the showbiz that has exploded over the past few decades on the island. It's important to note the complications that arise with Jean-Francois' insistence that singers come down from the stage and devote some time to the real tradition. As the discrepancy between the tradition and showbiz becomes an issue for cultural militants, self-conscious efforts like Jean-Francois' have arisen to save the tradition from being erased by the popular cultural production of it. From the point of view of many cultural militants, the efforts to revive the tradition have done more to destroy the Corsican patrimoine than to preserve it. When I asked Jean-André, our, our landlord's nephew and a singer of the Pagela, what he thought about all the efforts to revitalize the patrimoine, he said, quote, it's been important because otherwise we wouldn't be able to sing, but I worry in 25 years it's gonna be gone. The irony is that before, more people lived in the tradition in their everyday lives. Now with all the efforts, the schools, the museums, people live it less in the everyday, end quote. The irony thickens as we see that even Jean-Francois' database efforts 
designed to combat exactly what Jean Andre is worried about, look, in Heidegger's terms, very much like challenging forth, a process of extracting, collecting, and organizing. To capture, store, and systematize is in some ways fundamentally at odds with the, aspects, the aspect of Pagela singing that Jean Francois himself reveres, a kind of spontaneity and indeterminacy that, that like the fermier's cheese, is utterly connected to the time and place in which the singing arises. And Jean Francois was by no means unique in this regard. The desire to combat the standardization of the culture was pronounced among the most serious cultural militants and gave rise to a fascinating set of initiatives which often reproduced the very re problem they were trying to address. Very early one summer morning, we accompanied Marco and his wife, both cultural militants, who had become good friends of ours on a pilgrimage from a small village in the Castaniche, an area deep in the northern mountains of the island, to Fuminali, a village even further into the mountains and unreachable by car. That morning, about 50 people congregated as they had for over a decade since Petru, a local shepherd, had died. Each year they meet and walk to Fuminali, the village of Petru's ancestors, Except for Petru, who lived out his years in Fuminali, the village has been abandoned for over 60 years. The empty houses are boarded up, many now in ruins. We set off that morning, Jackson bundled into a hiking backpack on David's back, the line of people trudging one after another. Over two hours later, tired and hot, we began to hear sounds of life and smell of fire. <clears throat> we rounded a bend and heard Marco yell, Ayo! And he was answered in turn, A.O., there it is, he said, pointed, pointing excitedly through an opening in some trees. We followed him through the ruins of the village, hollow stone houses, decrepit walls marking the boundaries of people's land. As we got closer, Marco gained speed. He walked straight over to a group of about 15 men, aged 12 to 75, who were sitting, lined up on a wall of one of the crumbling houses, as men do in all village squares on Corsica. The men were laughing and joking. Marco seemed overjoyed to see them, though they are friends of his, whom he sees all the time. To reunite, to reunite in this space, he told us later, was a special occasion. He immediately took a cup of pastis and sat down with them. In the village square, there was one house slightly more intact than the others. Inside, there was a true Corsican hearth, the famous Forgone. It was lit. Corsican charcuterie hung from the ceiling to be smoked. Women were deep frying chestnut flour in cast iron pans, making beignets over the open fire. The crisp balls were filled with the brooch from the milk of a young shepherd's flock. The group of men Marco was sitting with soon began singing a pagiela. Over the course of the day, we watched as Marco's enthusiasm waned. He is a devoted singer of the traditional pagiela and committed to the spontaneity and natural emergence of the song. We sing just to sing, he told me. It doesn't matter how good it is. But every time we attended an event with him, by the end, Marco would be disappointed, telling us it was not the vraie tradition. He and his wife would critique other participants for not singing with the whole of themselves, for watching the singing as though it was a performance, for using guitars or reading lyrics from a traditional songbook. That, this didn't stop them from attending, even organizing, events of this sort but there was a strange love-hate relationship they had with their own efforts. Following the advice of a number of people who attended that pilgrimage, later that summer, I made the long drive from Sri Lanka across the island to Ajaxio to, an, to attend an event that they promised me would be something very special. It was called Comptoir Course, which translates to Corsican counter, indicating the counter of a bar. The advertisement for the concert read, quote, for one night, we leave the performative space in order to rediscover the improvisational and convivial space of a bar and a fete, end quote. To combat the increasing showbiz-like character of traditional singing, to recreate the informal atmosphere of a bar, a fully functioning Corsican bar had been built on the stage. A group of singers who were intentionally not part of the same musical group were invited to participate without rehearsal the, un, the idea, not unlike the trek to the, uh, to the abandoned village, was to combat the falsification of the tradition. The audience was seated at a cafe table surrounding the bar, 
We were welcomed by a man in a dark suit who encouraged us to get up whenever we wanted to get drinks and food from the bar and stage. We were meant to feel comfortable, to act as though we were au village. The singer sat at the corner of the bar facing each other, backs to the audience. Putting a bar and a non-performative non bar singing on a stage in an attempt to capture something spontaneous was a remarkable concept, if deeply problematic and doomed to fail. Part five, are we trapped? Heidegger anticipates the kind of struggle I witnessed in which the Corsican's very efforts to save the tradition often reinstantiated the codifying tendencies they were attempting to combat. In framing is what Heidegger calls the process of challenging forth in which we, quote, order the self-revealing as standing reserve, end quote. And in framing is the mode of revealing that holds sway over contemporary man. And framing comes from the German word gestell, which means literally bookshelf or rack, and is described by one editor as, quote, puts into a frame, framework or configuration everything that it summons forth through an ordering for use that is forever restructuring anew, end quote. And who, Heidegger asks, is responsible for inframing? At first blush, it looks like humans are. It is the human who mines the earth for ore, the human who harnesses the energy of the Rhine, and the human who codifies and packages Corsican culture. But Heidegger argues humans don't have control over the way, quote, in which at any given time the real shows itself or withdraws, end quote. As soon as we are involved in, as he puts it, meditating, striving, shaping, working, we already find ourselves in a mode of revealing which holds sway over us. Our experience of the world is always unnecessarily shaped by a mode of revealing. Jean-Francois's efforts to capture and save the tradition once and for all, or Marco's desire to evoke the real tradition by reproducing the conditions which constitute it in the hopes of ushering forth the desired effect, both enact challenging forth in framing, even as they try to resist it. The argument seems to be that all movement from the concealed to the unconcealed, the realm where truth happens, at any given time goes upon a way of revealing which holds complete sway over us. However, despite this, and here things get perhaps less pessimistic but a bit more confusing, this holding sway is not, Heidegger says, a quote, fate that compels, end quote. We are not simply programmed by it. For Heidegger, it is the human and the human only who has the ca capacity to respond to the call of unconcealment, not simply to obey. But what does this look like? How does it square with the fact that we cannot, just as Jean-Francois cannot, usher ourselves into a new mode of revealing? My hypothetical natural man may have been urged by particular needs when he set the club on its way. But his inclination and capacity to attend to the undetermined wilds of his environment as just that, a realm where things have not yet been determined and possibility lies, was required in order for this tool to be brought forth. It seems that for Heidegger, it is in our access to and reverence for that indeterminacy, the undisclosed itself, without which no disclosure could happen that our freedom lies. It seems that all modes of revealing, insofar as they hold complete sway over us, threaten this freedom. However, Heidegger argues that in framing presents an unprecedented danger in this regard, the supreme danger. Contemporary man faces a situation unlike the relationship that the fermier has to his cheese, or the traditional miller has to his grain, or the traditional pagiela singer has to his song. These traditional ways, though like everything else, influenced by a mode of revealing already in place, include something like reverence for or attention to the fact of arrival itself. The goot of the cheese bears witness to its unique coming into existence, and this is cherished. In Pagela singing, it is not the polished harmonies, but the unexpected turns that are celebrated. So although these modes of revealing necessarily distance humans from their capacity to respond to the call of unconcealment, 
to truly reach out like natural man does. Because the movement from the concealed to the unconcealed is foregrounded in the cheese, the song, etc., this, in an important way, may leave the channel open, so to speak, for the arrival of something previously undisclosed. There is a living and vital relationship between humans and the realm of Aletheia. In the time of modern technology, however, as our compulsion to order and inframe grows, the worry is that we cease to recognize that we are constantly present to the movement from the concealed to the unconcealed. We may cease to respond to the call of unconcealment because we have forgotten how to listen. Further, because in framing, leads so often to correct determinations. Technology and science are powerful in their predictive capacities. Heidegger suggests that we come to mistake the correct for the true. Correct calculations and orderings come to be understood as what truth is, and the realm of Aletheia retreats further. As he puts it, quote, precisely through these successes, the danger can remain that in the midst of all that is correct, the true will withdraw. The dominance of inframing, unlike bringing forth, presents a particularly pernicious problem because built into its machinery, so to speak, is the active obscuring of the movement from the concealed to the unconcealed. Our distance from the movement of revealing itself results results, Heidegger argues, in ways of being in the world that threaten to alienate us from our own most possibility, our human dignity, our freedom, permitting us, perhaps even enticing us, to stand by as the great song of the world fades. Part six, and this is the conclusion. The danger and the saving power, the hidden side of their nearness. In the last movement of the essay, Heidegger turns to what he calls the saving power. Rather than interpreting save as, quote, seize hold of a thing threatened by ruin, Heidegger suggests that we understand save as, quote, to fetch something home into its essence in order to bring the essence for the first time into its genuine appearing. The movement, end quote, sorry. The movement of saving is back toward what is already there, already here. Heidegger quotes Holderlin, who says, quote, but where the danger is grows the saving power also, end quote. And he agrees, arguing that even though in framing encourages man to privilege the correct over the true to such an extent that, threatens, that it threatens him at his core, it cannot simply block the lighting up of revealing, the, the appearing of truth. Rather, in framing must harbor itself within it the saving power, in framing cannot simply block revealing as such because in framing itself belongs to the realm of Aletheia. One aspect of this realm where things move from being concealed to being revealed that is easy to overlook is that things come forth at all, that there is an unconcealed actual arrival of reality at all. Why, Heidegger asks famously at the end of his essay, what is metaphysics, are there beings at all and why not rather nothing, end quote. In this sense, the persistence of the actual, of the unconcealed, is, as Heidegger puts it, a kind of granting. The self-showing of the real may arrive now one way, now another, as Holderlin's Rhine or the Rhine in the tourist camera lens, as Amandine's cheese or generic packaged cheese, as natural philosophy or as modern physics. But these ways, even if we could somehow sum them all up, are never enough to capture never enough to account for, the movement from the concealed to the unconcealed, the possibility of disclosure itself. As long as there is a world that has arrived, lit up by revealing, the lighting itself persists. It is a granting. And the fact that the granting inherent to revealing can never be eradicated, no matter how much it has been repressed or obscured, seems to be the saving power. Quote, the granting that sends in one way or another into revealing is as such the saving power. For the saving power lets man see and enter into the highest dignity of his essence. This dignity lies in keeping watch over the unconcealment and with it from the first, the concealment 
of all coming to presence on this earth, end quote. The suggestion is not, I don't think, to return to the way that Heidegger imagines, perhaps romantically, that the Greeks once lived, where their world seemed to sing constantly of the true essence of revealing, where techne and poiesis merged. Rather, the suggestion seems to be that we find freedom in confronting the danger inherent in enframing, bringing the danger close, holding it before our eyes. It is by confronting the ways in which enframing hides its own grounds, the ways in which technology obscures its own essence, that we find ourselves pulled toward the movement of disclosure itself. As Heidegger puts it, when we question concerning technology, rather than being confined to the, quote, stultified compulsion to push on blindly with technology, or what comes to the same thing, to rebel helplessly against it, we find ourselves unexpected, unexpectedly taken into a freeing claim. Jean-Francois, sitting with me, comparing Camelu and Maya Pesha's singing, is in some sense bringing the danger close. He is not frustrated, not alienated the way Marco is, but in a sense enlivened by the comparison. He cannot simply say the thing he finds so important. Quote, you're going to ask me what the difference is between this and that, but what do you want me to say, end quote. He does not feel defeated. In fact, he is invigorated by the contrast. He can see it, and he has confidence that I will too. There in the space between Camelo's swaying figure, aged face, warbling voice on the one hand, and the polished practice tones of Maya Pesha's performance on the other, lies a truth. You have to listen, he says. Heidegger says, quote, the essence of technology is in a lofty sense ambiguous. Such ambigu ambiguity points to the mystery of all revealing i.e. of truth. The irresistibility of ordering and the restraint of the saving power draw past each other like the paths of two stars in the course of the heavens. But, precise, but precisely this, their passing by, is the hidden side of their nearness. When we look into the ambiguous as essence of technology, we behold the constellation in which revealing and concealing in which the coming to presence of truth comes to pass." End quote. When we look into the ambiguous essence of technology, when we face the danger that threatens to numb us to the mystery of all revealing, the saving power is in a sense ignited. We are invited toward the constellation of concealing and revealing itself, and therefore toward the remarkable character of truth that we are in danger of forgetting. This turn toward the constellation is itself enlivening, not as a means toward, toward an end, but as a return to the already. In conclusion, I am left thinking about the seminar table, the way in which at St. John's we value when students and tutors try things out, think on the spot, speak from a place of spontaneity. And like the Corsican fermier, sometimes the conversations yield, and sometimes we have to jeter le fromage, so to speak. <laughs> but our conversations are not reproducible, not standardized. They are totally dependent on and reflective of the context in which they emerge. Like natural man whose inclination to reach out into that which has not yet been determined is the precondition for his setting a club on its way to arrival, the human inclination to reach out toward that which we do not yet understand is a necessary precondition for all the structures and arguments and explanations that shape our worlds. And in framing tends to cover this over, to privilege orders and systems that yield correct results, but to bury their necessary reliance on the possibility of revealing itself. It seems to me in this way, St. John's invites us to question in framing, and not simply because we want students to be the gatekeepers of their own reason, to decide for themselves what they think, but because we sense that a community that attends to and respects the coming to presence of the true encourages a walk through the world where the, where the arrival of the ordinary sings of its mysterious passage. Thank you.